So we're recording. So we are, so it's Thursday, August 30th, somewhere in the world, and Florida. And um, we're here tonight on Zoom. My name's Amy Shine. I'm an Access Certified Facilitator, amongst other, other things. And um, I'm joined here tonight with my friend, co-facilitator, colleague, and, um, and friend, mainly friend, Tom Gannett. The technology mystic. And totally doesn't have a clue about technology, but that's okay. He's going to hire a whole host of women to work for him. <laughs> <laughs> so send your CV to him <laughs> at Tom Gunnap. <laughs> so, um, so, so, yes, me and Tom, um, we like to have lots of conversations all the time. And sometimes they go on for hours. And one of the things we always seem to end up talking about is like um, just being different, really. And... Um, Tonight's topic is called the misfits, and um, I actually looked it up on just Googled it before the call started, which is really funny. The definition of a misfit is a person whose behavior or attitude sets them apart from others in an uncomfortable, conspicuous way. <laughs> so the word there that jumped out at me the most was conspicuous. <laughs> So oh, um, that's our topic tonight. We can go anywhere and everywhere. If you have a question, please jump in because, as you know, your questions is what creates the call and creates where we can go. And, um, yeah, do you have anything you want to say, Tom, to get the topic going? Um, you know, it, it, it's <laughs> – I love that definition, right? In fact, when I was, I was taking my shower, as it would be 20 minutes before the call, right? And – and I was, I was, I was just kind of, you know, did one of those, what some people talk about when they um, have near near death experiences, <laughs> right? Like I just kind of my whole light flashed in front of me, you know, like in that, in that shower, which it wasn't that long a shower, trust me. But I realized that from day one, I thought it was necessary to fit in. And yet, somewhere I knew that that was the last thing in the world that I would ever choose. And yes, the part that stuck out for me in that definition was uncomfortable. Because it takes something to be that different in the world. Yeah. And I don't mean different as in, like, that exploitive kind of difference, right? Which is fine. I don't, it's not that. It's just what it takes to stay that course of being true to you along the way. Because we see so much in the world today of abundance and success and all these, you know, like advertisements for what that is. We never even stop to think, is that true for me? Yeah. Do I care about the Ferrari and the Maserati and the mansion and the diamond rings? Or would I rather have some little cottage up in the mountains with the creek running through it and stashed with books and awesome food and bottled water. Wow. Can we stop there for a second? <laughs> you just blow my mind in the first minute, Tom. <laughs> wow. So that's, I really just want to stop for a second at this point because it's like, okay, so you're sold the dream, right? You come into this world, you're born, you grow up and whatever world you grow up in, whether it's Ireland, America, like, you know, um, Holland, freaking Australia, wherever you grow up, you're sold a certain kind of dream. And, you know, it's like, it's the family you grew up in. So maybe you want to aspire to be like your dad and maybe your dad had a load of money. So you feel under pressure to make that money or, you know, people become doctors because their fathers are doctors or whatever it is. And it's like, you're sold the dream. Like you said, like, maybe it's not your dream to have a red Ferrari and billions in the bank. And maybe it is, but it's like, have you ever, like how much sometimes do we even, do we even stop to ask, is this even my dream? Like we could be on like a hell bent mission to make tons of money and drive a Ferrari and live on the beach with a mansion. Whereas as you just said, Tom, maybe you actually don't want that. Maybe for you, you'd like to live in the mountains with piles of books and you know have nature all around you you can still have loads of money too doing that like but it's just like stopping and actually looking at okay well what is actually true for me here 
because it's so easy because okay one of the things about being a misfit is that you're different and one of the things about being different is that you most likely are psychic and one of the things about being psychic is that you pick up on everybody else's thoughts, ideas, and emotions 24-7, and you're like a sponge for them. So you're constantly absorbing whatever. You know, like it's like every one of us on this call wouldn't be on this call unless we know what everyone else wants, needs, desires all the time. But very rarely do we actually know what we want, need, desire, require. Because we're so psychic and tapped into everyone else's world that we can get wrapped up in their dreams and not even realize that that's not even my dream. Well said. <laughs> so maybe we all need to take a step back and look at our dreams <laughs> and ask, is this mine? <laughs> well, yeah, and that was that post that I put up, I don't know, a while ago that was, you know, don't be an ass with your ask. Because all the rage of the conversation now is all about your ask, but where are your where are your true intentions aligning with that ask? Yeah. Right? Is the energy that you be really that ask or is it something else? Because if we're not congruent with that thing, if we're still trying to think that we're supposed to have the Ferrari and the mansion and the diamond rings, and what we really want is this over here, that's fine for that person. But what we're trying to do is stay somewhere energetically in between the two. And it's never going to work because our ask will never align with that thing that we really want because we've still got some foot or some part of us over there with the Ferrari and the mansion and the diamond ring. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is that we, don't re we actually don't know what we want. It's like we think we want the Ferrari or the diamond ring or the marriage or the kids. And then when we get it, we're like, actually, I don't want this at all. This isn't what I want. And, you know, I mean, it's kind of unfortunate sometimes we kind of have to or it's not unfortunate, or maybe that's just how we learn, but we kind of choose everything we don't like before we get what we do like. So what if it's not, it's not wrong to want whatever you want and think that you want it, and when you get it, realize you don't really want that at all. I was in yoga the other day, and my like, yoga teacher was like, the thing you think you want when you get it, you realize you don't, didn't want it at all. <laughs> it's like, okay. You know, and like we're in a yoga class, but it's like even that way, doing yoga, like you think you want to do a handstand or whatever, and then you get it and you were like, oh, well, now I just jacked up my whole body trying to get there. And then I got there and realized it's not that big of a deal. You know? <laughs> so it's like a lot of us don't really know what we require, desire. We don't know what we actually want. And so sometimes we do require to go after things and get them and then realize it wasn't that important to me. Mm -hmm. And how quickly we use that measure, right, to make ourselves wrong. Yeah, well, we make ourselves the loop, right? There's the loop. That I am not getting, like the Ferrari's not showing up. But if I didn't really want the Ferrari in the first place, now I've got a way to make myself wrong for not having the Ferrari. It's like that carrot that stays out at the end of the stick that we're never going to get. And then we make ourselves wrong for it, yet we're still trying to chase it out there. Yeah, and so what about the whole thing about being a misfit is that the whole point of this is that, like, the thing about being a misfit is that you are so different. And the things that other people want aren't necessarily what you want. And you may like to have lots of money and drive nice cars and wear nice clothes, but if that doesn't really satisfy you at the end of the day, what is it that really satisfies you? And, and what how is do it you that, get there? And, yeah, and it's like, like so, what questions can you ask to get there, right? Yeah, and it's like, so the thing about being different is that, like, if we're to go back to when we were kids, you know, and as kids, we don't have, like, this massive desire to prove ourselves, right? We're not into the proving at that stage. As kids, we don't really have that, like, yet. We're not, still, you know, younger kids. I'm talking, like, before the age of maybe five. You're not into looking for your parents' validation or looking for, you know, your teachers or whatever. You're kind of just in that happy-go-lucky stage. And, like, what is it about being a kid? Like, what is it that makes you different? And, like, did, did you look around when you were a child and did you look around the world and be like, this place is kind of messed up? <laughs> you know, like, why aren't people happy? Why aren't you playing? Why is mom depressed? Why is dad always angry? Like, why are you always fighting? Where's the love? Like as a kid, you know, is that one of the things about being a misfit is that we actually did see a different possibility in the world. And is yeah. that actually what sets us apart sometimes? And what makes us feel so kind of disconnected sometimes from this reality? Because, you know, 
yeah, we can go for the cars and the money and all that. But at the end of the day, there's something very missing in that too. If it doesn't include consciousness, you know, if, it, if, if you're not choosing from consciousness and you're just choosing from getting it's, that can be quite soul destroying. And is that one of the things as kids that makes us feel so like, like I remember as a child going to school and being like, I don't know. Like I was like in a class of seven people and like, I couldn't, I felt so different. I felt so like not connected to anyone. The only person I ever felt connected to going to school was my brother. And cause I was close to him, but everyone else I was just like, so I always kind of hung off him. And I used to think I wanted to hang out with his friends, but I realized now I actually only wanted to be around him because it was an energy that he was for me, which was actually kindness and caring. And it was oneness. It was consciousness. He didn't have any judgments of me. He didn't create separation with me. He was always had my back. So being around him gave me that energy. It was like, oh, it's okay. It's fine. He's here. He's got your back. You know, it was this sense of oneness. But like everywhere else, I didn't feel it at all. Like in school, I just felt so weird and so different. So it's funny. Like, is that the whole thing about being a misfit? Mine was always hearing or seeing or thinking why doesn't anybody see what I'm seeing? <laughs> and still today, I mostly think that. Why aren't people seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah, what else can. is possible there? Yeah, and, and the why is the thing that keeps us in a lie. Like, why is a lie? It always keeps you going back into the loop. And like one of the, so one of the greatest things for me lately has been actually in acknowledging I am different. And really acknowledging it, like not just like, yeah, yeah, I'm so different. I believe in consciousness and possibilities. And I do this weird stuff called access bars and I do energy stuff and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, no, like you're like actually acknowledging, like as I'm around other people, acknowledging like I really am different. Not that I separate from other people, but looking at like, maybe I didn't come from this planet or maybe I did. It doesn't matter. But knowing that I actually see possibilities other people don't see. And like acknowledging that that's okay gives me the freedom to know I don't have to go around trying to like fit myself in anymore. You bet. I agree. Cause it's like uh, one of the, you know, greatest things I've gotten, I think from doing access consciousness is that um, they can't see you. They won't see you. They will never see you. And it's not about you. You know, so if somebody doesn't see or know about magic and possibilities and um, they can't see you creating it. So it's like, why would I waste my time trying to convince someone of magic and possibilities and how quick change can be and how, you know, life doesn't have to be hard. Why would I waste my time trying to convince someone of that? They can't even, they don't have that in their world as a possibility. So it's like. Like when you're, when you're around people like that, it's just like being aware that you're different, you know? And then it's like what the meaning of the word said here was conspicuous, okay? So a person, so misfit is a person whose behavior or attitude sets them apart from others. And like sometimes that's just even who you be sets you apart from others because you being present sets you apart from others. Like you see, most people can't even look at you in the eye. So you being, just being who you are sets you apart from others and in an uncomfortable, conspicuous way. So you actually make other people uncomfortable. And that's one of the things about being a misfit. We feel like we're so different, but we actually make other people feel really uncomfortable. So how aware are we all of other people's uncomfortableness? And then conspicuous is standing out so as to be clearly visible, attracting notice or attention. Oh, wow. So how much do we try not to stand out <laughs> while really standing out? <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. You can't see me. You can't see me, but really you can. Like, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, what size you are. It's like you stand out from the crowd. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So, Tom, can you tell me what it was like for you growing up being a misfit? Yeah, because you can imagine Tom trying not to be seen. <laughs> well, He's like yeah. the smallest guy wherever he goes. Well, and the interesting 
interesting part, even without the physical thing, right? It, it's that as a being, we chose our body, we chose this lifetime, we chose this reality, we chose all of this, right? And somewhere along that entry point, we had a game plan. I mean, we just didn't come in here to just kind of go, okay, let's see what shows up. We I'm didn't come in just to hang out, no? Or smack me down or like that, right? I mean, we had a game plan. Hello, right? Well, the yeah. work cognizant of that after we leave the incubator of our mother's womb or not, it's there. But we know how freaking different we are because we, we know infinitely that nobody is the same. That's the brilliance of it. That's why we yeah. chose to be here. You need that, to say you need well, to say that say that line you know, again. What's that? Say that line again. So you said you, you recorded know, this. I don't know. That shit comes in because <laughs> you said we know that we're different because because truthfully we really know that nobody is. We do know. Name. Absolutely, we know. Yeah. Right. So isn't that ironic that we know we're different because we know as infinite beings that nobody is the same, like nobody on this call here is the same. Like right. we, may have di we may have similar ideas, beliefs, whatever. We even use the same tools. We may speak the same language. But we're, ultimately, we're all different. So it's funny that we know that, but yet we still try desperately to fit in and to make ourselves be like someone else. And pretending that we like people. Pretend, say that again? Pretending yeah. that we like people. Pretending that we like people. Oh, that's brilliant. I do like people. I don't. <laughs> well, you do. You actually do. You Here's the thing. To I really don't. Do. What, somebody, what somebody pointed out to me somewhere along the line was that I love everybody, but I don't have to like everybody. Well, and you may I not have... like people, but you have a caring in your world. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. But do we always function from that place of knowing that we're operating 24 seven from our infinite being and that we're always looking at the other person's infinite being? No. That's why we're doing this shit, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so I have a question that came from somebody who's not on the call. And it's a question about um, okay, Tom, I'm going to get you to address it, all right? Because I know this person, so I prefer to have someone who isn't connected. Um, so it was, okay, she wanted to ask about, she was wondering about severe feelings of awkwardness and, and feeling like she was very out of place all the time, especially at work. She thinks she's got social anxiety. Did you say you didn't want me to come in or you did? No, no, you address that. Take it away, Dr. Tom. Oh, I thought maybe I was the one that wrote the question. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about, right? Not ever feeling like we fit in. Because basically what I was talking about when we come in, we've written our own menu. We know the things that we like. We know what's going to, like the demand we are of ourselves that will have us change that. And one, two things that we can admit that we really don't like everyone. In fact, we don't like most people. And two, that we are aware. Yes. We're extremely aware. And when we're picking that stuff up from other people, that's not ours. That's easy for us to say that have done some work. But some people that haven't, or a lot of people that haven't, that's the furthest thing from their reality. Yeah, she's pretty new to these tools, you know, and she's just yeah. starting to get it and get it or not get it, whatever. And so for her, it's a very real thing that when she's at work, she has around people and she feels totally awkward and she can't talk to the people around her work. And when she does open her mouth, she feels like she's totally stupid. And then she goes into all the judgment of herself afterwards and she just feels so awkward. And not just at work, in other situations too. So she seems to think that she has this thing called social anxiety. So anxiety actually is, um, 
so anxiety is actually an, an overload of awareness. Absolutely. So one of the of other people's fucked awareness, up. awareness of what other people are thinking, feeling about exactly. themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so I know this particular person, she's a SpongeBob and I'm a SpongeBob too. I'm sure there's other people on the call who know what that is. It's like, so when you, if you grew up in a home where there's a lot of anxiety, say your mother had a lot of anxiety or your father had a lot of anger or your mother had depression or whatever it was, you become a SpongeBob for that particular emotion. So it's like you grew up around it. So it's like that, that particular emotion you really know or that particular thing. So because you're so psychic and you're so aware and you're so different, you only have to walk past someone on the street with that energy that you grew up around, be it anger, rage, shame, guilt, anxiety, whatever, money problems, and you will literally absorb that energy. Like it, it'll just be like, oh, I'm anxious. Oh, I'm angry. Oh, I'm sad, you know? And, and so it's like, okay, so what do you do with that, right? First, you got to freaking acknowledge. And start, well, first you got to start asking who does this belong to? And like, we, you have to use this tool for you. Otherwise, you will never get the awareness yourself. And people can talk about this tool as much as they want. But until you start actually going about and for every thought, feeling, emotion that comes in, start asking, is this mine or someone else's or something else? And return to sender. Because when you start using that, you'll start to become aware of how much you are actually picking up on. And you'll start to realize that you're not as fucked up as you think you are. And then when you start acknowledging that, you might start acknowledging you're actually psychic. You're actually aware. You actually are a SpongeBob. But it has to come first with you acknowledging your, you and your capacities. And then when you're around those energies, you'll start to become more aware of them and be like, oh my God, that person has a lot of anxiety. It's not mine. I'm just aware of their anxiety. Or that person has a lot of anger. It's not mine. I'm just aware of them. But if you don't acknowledge it, nothing ever changes. You think you're fucked up. You, are, you go into a room, you soak it all in like the sponge does. And then you walk out of that room totally fucked up, thinking you're a mess, thinking you need help and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then the monk, and then that's just, you're on the, what's it called? The hamster wheel. And you're just going round and round and round. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's yeah. practice, right? There's a, there's, there's, you know, having the tools and, and having the verbiage and all of that is awesome. Any tool, any modality, they work, right? But it takes working them. And what, what, what I've found, because in, especially in the last two and a half, three years, I've worked with a lot of people that have had, well, longer than that was suicide stuff mainly, but, but a lot of people with some pretty in, that terminology, horrific abuse stuff, right? Whether it's sexual, whether it's verbal, whether it's physical, whatever it is. Somewhere we all have that. This reality thrives. The addiction of this reality is not so much anti-conscious as much as how it shows up is in abuse. Whether it's verbal, whether it's physical, whether it's sexual, it doesn't matter. One way or another, I could almost guarantee that everybody on this call could raise their hand more than once and identify numerous times in school where they had the answer that may or may not parallel what the teacher wanted, but there was an infinite knowing of what that was, and the teacher didn't get it to the level that we did, and immediately the hand went down. And then ever forward, we were reluctant to raise our hand for fear of that thing not matching up. That's yeah, abuse. that's abuse of you, that's yeah. Abuse. And you start, you start doubting. That's when the doubt starts. You start doubting yourself. You start doubting your knowing. And one of the things Jane said to me about being a sponge, he said, is that um, a lot of times he said you don't want to acknowledge how actually aware you really are. So you would rather think that you're the one fucked up now you're the one with all this shit going on. They acknowledge you're actually picking up from everyone around you. That's their infinite kindness, right? Yeah, you would rather think that you're the fucked up one than acknowledge that the people around you are incredibly unhappy, have a lot of anxiety, or have a lot of stress, or you know, are competing with you, um, are competing with themselves, hate themselves. You would rather think that you're the problem than look at them. And, and then the overcompensation is how many people get into this line of conversation from a place of help and fix. 
What do you mean by that? Thank you, Becky. <laughs> well, it's kind of like I, I, I remember years ago when I was considering, you know, like I was taking a bunch of sociology and psychology classes in college until I realized they were more fucked up than any, anybody I ever knew. <laughs> and, and then I didn't want anything to do with any, you know, like, hello. And there were still some tools and principles in that stuff that were contribution, right? Yeah. But I immediately had this awareness of what it must be like for a guy to be married to a woman or a woman be married to a guy that was a psychiatrist. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, or like a policeman. You, you have your reins in on this idea of facilitation, right? Then you're operating 24-7 as a superior bitch. Yeah, but you, I mean, so there's a difference between it being a facilitator and being, you know, a therapist and, you know, and also you have amazing therapists in the world too. So it's like, you know, you got to look at like, uh, so it always comes back to you. So like this oh. particular person who mailed me with this question afterwards, I said to her, when was the last time you had your bars run? And she said two months ago. I was like, okay, you might want to look at getting your bars run. Okay, so for anyone who's listening to this in the future, bars, it's a hands-on body process. It's light touch of, uh, it's a light touch system of points on your head. And basically what it is, it's like a deletion system for all the thoughts, ideas, and emotions that are running. But it's also for all the stuff that you pick up and you absorb from in the world. You know, you go into your workplace, you absorb the anger there, you absorb the anxiety, whatever, you know, you're around your husband, like whatever it is, your kids, the stress, the stuff that you get caught up in day to day. And it's like, if, if you aren't actually like getting and prioritizing you and taking care of you, you actually can contribute to other people, you know? And that's one of the things that I love about being a facilitator is that I don't facilitate for other people. I facilitate for me. Every class I do is for me. You know, and then people come along for the ride, which is great, you know, but it's like, really, I'm facilitating me and my life. And one of the main things I've seen for me is always, always, always prioritize me first. I, you know, like if I feel like myself getting cranky, getting irritable, even if I start to feel anxiety myself, which I do from time to time, it's like, I know it's time to get my bars run. And for me, it's bars. And it's other stuff. It's movement, it's dance, it's yoga, it's massage, it's facials. It's like, there's a whole load of stuff I do to take care of myself. But it's like, if you're going to be in the world and you are psychic and you are different, then you're going to require some things to take care of yourself. Right. You're going to require yeah. some, like, it's, like, you're screwed if you don't. <laughs> well, that's what, that's where I was going with that facilitator, teacher, psychiatrist yeah. Right? is that what happens is we come in and we create this menu and we, we, we really, I mean, consciously or subconsciously or whatever, we know that, you know that we're here for something great. Doesn't matter who we are. We're here for something great, period. And what happens is from the moment we leave the hospital, if not sooner, we're getting told how to do something. Yeah. There was a great line in the song by Cat Stevens. I put it up in a post a number of years ago. From the moment I could talk, I was ordered to listen. It's pretty much how it is. We're in this free-for-all with crayons and coloring outside the line, a big bang boom, and then they stick us in kindergarten or preschool. Now they start them at, what, two or three or something. I mean, it's like, how soon can we program? And immediately, we're wrong. So this person that you're talking about, I would guess has been in that same kind of system to deprogram that and assume because we all think we should be fixed in the next five minutes. We're living in a society that one pill is going to cure everything, right? One clearing statement is going to clear everything. Yeah. It's one pop and pop. Of that, right? That's why we're still here. <laughs> and sometimes those people, what, what I was really aiming at with this whole thing around the abuse and the, and the, and the suicide, is that that's the end result for some people. Whether they choose it in the way that we normally think of suicide or whatever, ultimately all death is a suicide. It's a choice. But what she's caught up in is not knowing how to unwind this thing to know that she is all that greatness that she chose and knew she was the minute she decided to come into this reality. Yeah. And sometimes it's a one-on-one -on -one that we can be that for each other.
We know we can. But we're also programmed to believe that if somebody's in front of the classroom or they have a distinction after the comma, after their name, that they have the proficiency to handle that stuff. That's not in our ask. That's an assumption. That's a knee-jerk reaction. So it's really about having a conversation with what is that really for you of light and heavy? How do you know that that thing is really something that you would choose? Because it all comes back to that. What is your awareness? We take this capacity, this gift that we get from the moment that we come in called awareness. It's who we be. It's our greatest gift. And the first thing that happens when we leave the hospital, it gets like that. And what we know now is that given that gift and letting it ride fully, there isn't anything we can't create. And I love Cass mentioned here, and when we have our bars run, so much of that program slips away and we are, so, we are ourselves again. Yep. You know, like that you actually start to get, every time you get your bars run, you get more of you. Like that programming, and it's, it's not even like, it's not like, we're not saying like, okay, you know, it's just like the programming slips away, like Cass talked about, like the programming starts to leave and you start to get more of you. And when you have more of you, then you realize I am different. I don't fit in. I, don't, I do see things other people don't see. Um, I am psychic. I am really aware. And like I do absorb other people's stuff. And, like, and now how can I use it to my advantage to actually create my life rather than use it to destroy me? You know? And so it's like it becomes this whole like, transformation. That's what transformation is in a way. It's moving from like I'm so fucked up to like actually what's right about me I'm not getting and what do I want to create? You know, and you started off the call, Tom, with like going into straight into the ask. Like, is what you're asking for really what you'd like to ask for? You know, and, and like, but the thing is, like, as long as all that programming is running, you won't get clear on what it is that's really true for you. Mm -hmm. So it's like. Yeah, it's really about creating your own menu, right? Mm -hmm. Creating your own menu for your own restaurant. And anytime you wake up and you go, oh, well, I don't really like that anymore. Okay, cool. Now what? Yeah. I'm okay with that. Right? Wow, I just tried this. So I might want to add that to the menu. But it's from that place of infinite choice. Not based on somebody else's red Maserati in the mansion and the diamond ring. And it takes practice. It takes some flexing of the muscle and use of the tools to get there. It doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, and I think that's a really important thing here because it's like, like you said, it's so easy to look outside of you and look at your teachers or your facilitators or whoever it is, you know, and think that, well, they have it all sorted, you know. They're living great and they're happy and it's like, well, they didn't get there overnight either, you know, and it does take a practice and it's constantly practice. You know, if I decided not to get my bars run for a couple of months and not use the tools, I can guarantee you my life would probably start decaying at a very fast rate, you know, or if I didn't do the things that nurtured my body and nurtured my soul, if I didn't move my body a couple of times a week and get exercise and do yoga and do, and do breath work and all and use questions and call and have conversations like this and listen to calls. And it's like I surround myself with the things that I know nurture my body and nurture my soul. Because otherwise, I will start to die. I will start to decay and die. And I'll start mm -hmm. to destroy everything around me. Because as fast as I can destroy things, I can also create them. So like you said, it's not, this isn't like a, a one magic fix, like take a pill, you're going to be better. You know, it's not also like you need to like eliminate this from your life and then everything's going to be great. And that's, that's where we're always in the like, I'm the problem, let me get the fix, you know, the addict, the drug, like whatever it is you think is the problem and you think this will fix it. It's like, we're not here tonight to say like bars is going to fix you or we're not here to say questions are going to fix you. But definitely uh, picking up the tools that work for you and using them on a daily basis and building those muscles will change over time. But you got to pick up the tools. Like, I can't make you ask a question. You can't make it, me ask a question. I can't make you do anything. So it's like, you got to help yourself at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Question. Really, yes, question. Really getting that it's a practice. 
like there's no there there. Total practice. There's nowhere to get. Well, there's no destination, right? Absolutely, right? And it's, it's really being okay with choosing from the place that you know is your fucked upness. Yeah, well, the, we're back to, you know, what if everything that you've decided is wrong with you is actually your greatest capacity and talent and ability, you know? Yep. Did you have a question, Kimberly? For someone? I did. Yes, go for it. Okay. Um, so it's a similar process as what an alcoholics would go through in an A program because they have to keep going to program to work the steps to find the higher power to be a part of the higher power to be a part of that practice every day correct so i'm sorry well what's the question so to practice this all the time it's not really a question though hold on let me think about that for a minute sorry well kimberly I want to ask her. Go on, go. She can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Is, is, is that your experience? I guess so, and that's my experience. But he's always put me different places, like the higher power is, into all my professions, into access consciousness, into all, everything that's come good my way has always been from asking a higher power. So, so what is that higher power to you? Yeah. Well, I guess it's, it's just something that, I, I can't explain. It's, it's almost like I trust him and ask him questions and, and I don't need the answers, but I do like a meditation and I, I've done and I've watched magic and I've been magic and, and all that sorts of stuff. And so coming part of access, it just intertwines, inter, intertwines, intertwines with, and that's how I, I see it. So practicing access consciousness and, and needing my bars run actually right now as as teaching and all of that it's fascinating to me and it's brilliant because a lot of the things like contribution i've heard be a contribution but i didn't understand a contribution so i guess it's just many tools put together yeah right? many tools and consciousness because i believe my higher power power has always been consciousness when i talk to people i mean it's out of consciousness normally because it just is i mean and and i see Hmm. So would you say the way that you're working your program is working for you? Definitely. In this 10 seconds? Definitely. So can I ask you one more question? Please. Why would you think that that was wrong? Oh, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just connecting with the fact is how the tools will go together, how hmm. they go together. So, so can I just comment on that? Yes, please. Because... I didn't, I didn't mean to say that you had it that it was wrong, but somewhere in your speaking had it that there was like a question there of, well, this is working for me, and it doesn't seem to be the same as the way everybody else is doing it, so maybe I'm missing something. Am I missing something in access consciousness that I could be where I'm more aware of who I am? Sweet. Now there's an awesome question, right? But it isn't making the way that you're doing it currently wrong. It's what can I add to this yeah. that could even have it be greater for me. It's not about dropping from where we've been. Most of us that have been around the block a couple of times have done a million other modalities before we came into access. And we're not yeah. saying access is and we're not saying access is the answer either, because it's like so um me and Tom have both did the AA program and I've studied the big book many times. It's an anonymous program. Oh sorry. I just gave your identity away. And um I'm quite proud of it. I will like, yes. like AA changed my whole life. And um you know, but one of the step one of the things in the big book was that we know only a little more will constantly be revealed. And it was you bet. And, so and that's far. where I'm so grateful. Yeah. And that's where I become grateful for being a part of access because all of a sudden it's like oh, wow. More, thank yeah. you. But can right. I just say something there, Kimberly? Because you just touched on something, and you know, maybe it's not this doesn't ring through for you, but maybe it does for other people. So you talk about the higher power, you know, access talks about universe. Some people say God, some people say spirit, whatever it is, right? 
I think um, for me, I have to be really aware, and I did it in A2, where I don't make the higher power outside of me. And I don't put the yes. universe outside of me. Same when you do access. Like if you're going, universe, what would it take? The universe isn't out there. The universe is in here. Yes. And so it's like, you know, like that thing of like go within for the answers. And it's like sometimes I think, you know, what I've done a lot is like the universe is out here, God's out here, higher powers out here. And I'm always kind of looking up, being like, help me, give me the answer or, or not even, you know, or just like even what I'm talking to or what I'm communicating to is outside of me. And, um, you know, really for me, it's like a practice of like dropping my walls, dropping my barriers and letting the universe in and letting consciousness in and letting God in and letting higher power in and letting energy in because it's like I could go out all day you know but it's like how much do I actually allow myself to be vulnerable and actually let the universe have my back and let it in my back and let and for you maybe higher power or whatever it is because it's like sometimes and I see a lot in metaphysics is where they put that outside of you like you know, that energy is outside of you. The spirit is outside of you. Like the energies are coming from outside of you rather than you are that, that is you. Yes, you create your magic. Nice. And I think that's probably one of the greatest mysteries is because there is something greater than us and it's also a part of us and we're also that too. So it's like, but for me, it's really the vulnerability of, letting it in because we, we spend so much of our lives trying to protect ourselves and trying to build up walls and do it by ourselves and work hard and we're, we're doing it alone. And it's like, God, just to sit back and realize, you know, there's a whole universe there wanting to contribute to us if we would just let it in. Whew. <laughs> how much easier would life be if you just let it in <laughs> thank you thank you Kimberly how is it Kimberly So anyone else got anything else you want to ask, add, comment? You realize how much you've been funny to me. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, Kate, I'm just reading the chat. Becky wrote, not broken, no fixing. Amen, sister. And Kate wrote, you realize how much you've been holding back. What are you going to say, Tom? Um, I think it, <clears throat> I was just kind of reflecting on where this call kind of came from because originally we were going to call it free radicals. I know. Right. <laughs> it's kind of how it showed up. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling rather rebellious today in case anybody could. One of the things that I cracked up about in the shower was that the previous call, it was like raw and uncut, and then it was like you and I both talked about being unplugged, right? Like it, it, Amy and oh, yeah. unplugged, right? And when I was standing in the shower, the unplugged part didn't <laughs> come to me immediately, and so it was unleashed. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's pretty much where I punched it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> everything that just brought up, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> right around good bad public culture it's funny because we went to create the call i had like the misfits written on our graphic but then the actual call on the vent i had called free radicals it's like i was totally like all over the place worked, i didn't though. know it what worked. the call was called <laughs> it's like we don't fish we are misfits Right. And we are radically different, like simple as that. And the more you can start to step up and acknowledge that, the more easy your life gets here. You don't have to resist this reality anymore. You don't have to resist the people. You don't have to feel like you're such an outcast. I actually think I probably feel more like more connected to other people right now than they probably do to themselves. Cause when I'm around them, I'm just not, I don't try to like, I just get it. Like I'm different. 
you know, I'll do the small talk and the whatever back and forth stuff. And then I'll just go on my way and I'll go create what I know I came here to create, you know? And it's like, I don't get caught up. If people are like, oh, you see this in the news? I'm like, yeah, I don't watch the news. I don't watch TV. I don't apologize for myself. I don't apologize for the fact that I don't know anything but going on in politics. You know, if that interests you, great. It doesn't interest me, so I don't watch it. You know, like I don't do stuff to fit in anymore. And it's like, and I definitely think one of the great things or one of the best things for me is to not apologize for me. Like I am who I am. This is what I like. If you don't like it, fine. See you later. You know, I'm, this is the stuff that interests me. So either come along with me or see you later. But it's like, what if that's not wrong? Yeah, and that's an awesome point right there for, for, that, for that first question that you mentioned, Amy, is that one of the things that I've noticed in doing this stuff for a while, right? <laughs> and it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, we are who we are. And, you know, the menu changes and who we be changes. And, you know, I realized a long, 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 long time ago for me to go do a job for 30 years in a row in that same job over and over again, I would have been at Guns or Us the day after I got hired, right? Because it's just not who I be. Now, has that taken some lumps along the way financially, et cetera? Absolutely. But I'm, I'm, there, there is that underlying dedication for me choosing for me that I'm not willing to sell out for whatever that thing was that I perceived it to be. My point with this is, is that along the way, we're changing every day, every minute, every second, whether we want to or not, right? And for no other reason that our environment changes that rapidly and we are forced to change. And that post or that message that I sent out last night about Facebook, it's just like I'm no longer willing to be at the demands of Facebook, right? So that's why I did that thing. It was like, okay, what can I create that doesn't lock me into that paradigm? What I, my point of all this is, is for her is that in that course of transformation, this thing called life, which was that post that I put up yesterday, right? Is that we're constantly changing. So the idea that we're going to hold the same place with our family, that we're going to hold the same place with the friends that we had 40 or 30 or 20 or 10 years ago, really? Are they willing to change to the degree that we are? Are they going to go the exact direction that we're going to go when we're going to go it? Thank God there's a million ways of doing all this transformation stuff because we would have been so pissed off as humanoids because the lines would have been too long if there was only one way. So for her, my point of this is, is that right now in my life, where it is at 63 years old, most of my closest friends, not acquaintances, friends, that I know that for sure freaking have my back, and can put up with my crazy like this, or can put up with my crazy when I'm a little more like not that radical. I've known for less than a couple of years. I still have friends that are, you know, that I knew growing up. I don't chum around with them like I used to. We've all changed in our own different ways, and we don't share a lot of the same likes. We have our own new menu today. What happens so much is we try to keep fitting into that thing and we're never going to fit in. We're never going to fit in. And what would it take to be okay with, with that? Now I can point out your little mic is not in. I forgot I was muted. <laughs> I'm a technological genius in one hour. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like one of the questions you can start asking is what would it take for me to be okay with not fitting in? And one of the questions I love playing with asking every day is what would it take for me to receive the greatness of me today? And universe, show me, show me the greatness of me today. Cause you know, we like to doubt ourselves a lot and we like to not acknowledge ourselves. And when you ask the universe, the universe, show me the greatness of me and you really mean it, the universe will show you and you'll be like, Oh my God. <laughs> I'm not that that I would recommend you not asking yeah. is universe show me where I'm in resistance oh wow I like that Tom well you may not I started asking that last summer I know I like it but I, it's not let me tell you and yeah. it's a little bit more intense than asking the question of where am I not in allowance 
That's like for the puppy dogs, right? But if you ask that question, where am I in resistance? It's like it's so true. when you start to become Brace yourself. Yeah. Where you start to become aware of what you're in resistance to, what does that show you? Me. Okay. Everywhere where I'm not willing to be me. Full throttle me, right? Like like all the all you know, and as you move on in this lifetime, you did the age thing early on, and I guess I kind of categorically put myself at the not quite the octologian category, but closer to it than so, right? That okay. It's time to put the pedal to the metal. Quit fucking around, right? But there's also been this amazing ride along the way. Has it had its moments? Absolutely. But guess what? In those moments were the greatest gifts. It yeah. took sometimes months or years later for me to recognize that because we don't always see it in the moment, right? But that's where it was. So what... Whatever you allow us to work through those things and avoid a lot of those pitfalls and those holes in the road that other people have had, right? More rapidly, with less frequency. So whatever you're resisting is where you actually have judgments. So whatever you're resisting, you have a judgment of, which actually is the judgment you probably have of yourself, which stops you from having more of you and actually has you annihilating parts and pieces of you to hold that resistance in place. So, wow. Well, Don't ask that question. I'm going to ask it. I like it intense. I'm good. Here's, here's what I highly <laughs> recommend for all you spiritual people. Write it on a piece of paper, take it out in the backyard and burn it. <laughs> Pretend it was never there. Well, you know, like how much do you resist being different? How much do you resist standing out from the crowd? How much do you resist, resist, you know, being the one who makes the most money in your family? How much do you resist being great? How much do you resist being great? How much do you resist compliments? How, do you, how much do you resist showing up and actually being as talented as you are? You know, sometimes it's more easier to be fucked up than it is to be powerful. How much do you resist being a misfit? Exactly. How much do you resist? Yeah. How much do you resist being the different that you are? How much do you resist fitting in while trying to fit in? Oh, everything that is. Can we just try and create it all? Right, wrong, good, bad, pop, pop, on the shorts, boys and beyonds. How much do you resist the misfit that you actually are? Tom, everything that is destroying and created, right, wrong, good, bad, pop, pop, all in shorts, boys and beyonds. And if you weren't resisting it, what else would be possible? How much, How much do we resist the universe? How much do we resist the universe? Or well, how much do we resist, resist this reality? Or, yes, or this reality. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's the power. biggest one, is how much do we resist being in this reality, and we chose it. Yeah. So ultimately, we're resisting ourselves. Because you are, because we are part of this reality. Just that we chose it. Yeah. And we chose it. You want to talk about a Mobius strip of fucked upness? <laughs> I mean, it's perfect, right? <laughs> then we can absolutely prove that we can never be happy. Because we cho because we're in this reality. Yeah, and we made R the mistake of choosing it. Rather than just acknowledging, I chose to come here. It, you know, it may not be the funnest place, but what, what, for what reason they choose to come here? Right? What? That's all a point of view. It's, yeah, interesting point of view. So now I'm resisting it. So what else would be possible? What would it take to, for me to create a reality totally beyond this reality? A reality that works for me that nobody else can see? Because that's the thing. We keep trying to get other people to see our reality and they'll never see it. Well, yeah, and that's perfect because I, I remember seeing this thing on this wall years ago at, I don't know, some transformation club of the day, whatever the soup du jour was. And it said on this plaque, it said, if I'm okay with me, I've got no reason to make you wrong. Oh, I love that. <laughs> if I'm okay with but me, I've got no reason to make you wrong. I mean, you know, of course, the being that I am, like, well, how the fuck do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, that, is that even possible? 
<laughs> right? Can I be okay with me enough to be in that space? Because notice where we go when we're not being our full throttle us, right? We're, you know, it's like somebody did something wrong or something, you know, like we're totally out into somebody else's universe. Mm -hmm. Does that ever work? And also how much do we resist contribution from the universe and other, and the universe means people in this universe. So the universe sometimes isn't just this like, Oh, magical fairy dust coming out from the sky. Like the universe is people, like people that live in this reality is the universe. So we resist this reality. Then we're resisting the universe. We're resisting people in this universe. We're actually resisting contributions from people in this reality. The inability to receive from everything. Wow. Yeah, and if, if we admit that, you know, like if we're willing to admit that, yeah. there's an opening there, right? That's why this last foundation that I did when I was working with this gal, and, and she just, like, I mean, she just broke down when she got that she just didn't like people. And then the whole room could admit it, right? That they yeah. basically, <laughs> for most people, they didn't like. And you can go into all the psycho babble about, well, I don't like my and all that shit. But the bottom line is, 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 is we coexist on this planet knowing that most people are not functioning from where we know we can, including ourselves. Because if we were How really be willing to receive of infinite being, it would be a totally different experience. But here's the thing, what we're doing with the tools and what we're doing with our whatever our path is for this thing called transformation is we're gathering tools to be okay with all of it and be able to receive from everything and be in allowance of however it shows up. And if Trump wants to get into office or Canada wants to choose what they're choosing, whatever, it doesn't matter. Because it really doesn't have any real effect on me. Really? Unless you allow it. That's the allowance piece. Yeah. If I'm really okay with me, I've got no reason to be over in somebody else's stress here. So if you, if we're just, cause we're coming towards like the hour. So if we were to leave people, cause there's like over a hundred people who registered for this call tonight. So there's going to be lots of people listening to this after to the recording and in the future. And if we were to, you know, leave people with a couple of tools that they can take with them, they can start implementing in their daily life to give them more ease with being here, being on the planet, being in this reality. What would you give them? I would start with the who does it belong to tool. <laughs> For every thought, idea, and emotion, ask who does it belong to? Mine, someone else, or something else. And when you start getting how much you actually pick up from other people, you start acknowledging how aware you really are, things get easier. What else is possible? Mm -hmm. Yes. Somebody very brilliant along the access path told me, grab a couple that work for you and play with them for 30 days. I mean, grab some people who have a, have a life that you'd like to have and grab, hang, hang out with them. And I was really talking about more about grabbing a couple of tools, right? Like, just grab a couple that resonate for you. Oh, why, oh why the way you more? said that, Tom, sounded like grab a couple, like a couple, and play with them. Like, it did not sound like what you just... Minute, man, Basically, I, what Tom was saying... I just teleported into a, a second relationship. Take class. a couple of tools. <laughs> But for people who don't know the tools, whatever yeah. works. <laughs> we'll get your bars run if Somebody you that didn't catch the very beginning when I was talking about handlers will probably be a little confused at this point. If, if you're asking me what tool that for, like, there, there's, there's two that I think go really hand in hand. One is what's right about this I'm not getting, which I love the acronym, which very few people use, is RATING, W-R-A-T-I-N-G. Because you don't see that one too much like that, right? And the first time I wrote it like that, I was like, wow, that's pretty weird, right? It's sister or brother, if you're into the Justin iPod thing, that's one of Becky's favorites, is interesting point of view. I have that point of view. Yeah. And really and take it on. And so, and again, what's right about this I'm not getting, also what's right about me that I'm not getting. 
was a massive for one for me at the start because I had so much judgment of myself and so much wrongness. And I asked that over and over, what's right about me that I'm not getting? Because that's when you start asking that question, the universe will start showing you your gifts, your talents, your abilities. And the more you start to acknowledge you and see the greatness of you, the less it matters what other people are doing or thinking or saying or feeling or judging, you know? So it's like, just start playing with those couple of tools and mm-hmm. see what happens. One that really works too when you're in a pinch and you're having a bad day. What's fucked up about them? I'm not getting. <laughs> Sorry. A raised that one. Never mind him. That's not a two. He just made it up. <laughs> I, don't know. Using- reference. <laughs> I like what's right about me. I'm not getting. I love that one. I like that tool. I use that and I certainly had seen a change. And within that, I got to say to other people, well, what's right about you? You're not getting. Oh, like really what's right about you? You're not getting, you know? So it's a tool that certainly like, oh, wow. (laughs) It it turns everything 360. Like it, it really turns your whole reality around, you know? And it's, and like we spoke already in the call and we'll finish on how it's like after this, it's like, that's the practice. You know, you're so programmed. You're so used to being in the problem and trauma and drama. And there's something fucked up about you when you start to, and that has to be where you start to use that question. You start changing your programming. You start changing how you think about yourself on autopilot all day long. You got to throw those, you know, I love Gary Douglas. He says, you know, the antidote to everything is a question. Absolutely. Everything is a question. The question is the interrupt that changes everything. So when you're on that all a pilot of, you know, I'm so weird, I'm so different, nobody likes me, I'm so blah, blah, I'm so fucked up. And if you're willing to just for that second, just go, you know what? What's right about me that I'm not getting? That, that's, the, that's the interrupt. Uh, interrupt all those thoughts. But you have to use that yourself. We can't make you do it. Cool. Guys, thanks for being here. It was great. We'll Thank do some you, more time. everyone. Tom, right? We have um, me and Tom are going to do a telecall, two telecalls um, together. Well, not together, two telecalls spread apart. <laughs> and it's called um, How to, what are we calling it? Um, shopping for your reality. And um, we're going to kind of get into more of the ass that Tom talked about tonight on the call, looking at what it is you'd like to have your reality go out in, and we're going to do home play and we're going to do a Facebook group and we're actually going to do a lot of like exercises and going out and shopping for your reality and finding out what it is you'd like to have as your reality. So that will be coming up um, in September. We'll send you some information about it in the follow up email. And you have a foundation coming up in September. Oh, yeah. I have a foundation in September in Florida. And then um, that's the last weekend in September. And then Tom is coming to Florida in November. And the two of us are co-facilitating a foundation. This Again. In November. Again. It's our yearly thing. Yearly reunion. <laughs> so we'll send that information in the follow-up email as well. So thanks for coming on tonight, guys. Really appreciate you for being here. And for being part of, like these conversations. So cool. Wish I had this when I was five in school, (laughs) but we have it now. So that's all that matters. (laughs) Thank you. Have a good